My name is Dante Loretta. I am a Regents Professor of Planetary Science at the University of Arizona, and I serve as the Principal Investigator for NASA's OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission. When we got inside the capsule, which we did very quickly within a couple of days of landing on the ground, we got the sample return capsule open. Inside there was the sample collection device called the TAGSAM, which stands for Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism. This was the piece of hardware that actually contacted the surface of asteroid Bennu and scooped up the sample. There were two fasteners or screws that were stuck and we encountered that in uh, very quickly after arrival at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. The good news was we could actually access the sample inside the tag SAM by bringing it out through the indoor. It went through that mylar flap. We could see the large particles. We pulled out over 60 grams of material, which was the mission requirement, and decided to go down the science path, letting the NASA engineers take their time to deliberately design some specific tooling to crack open those two stuck screws. One thing you learn in a program of this scale and time is patience. And you understand that things happen, hardware doesn't always behave the way you expect it to, and you've got to take your time, be deliberate, and solve the problem. I wasn't too upset about it because we got so much sample out really quickly that the science didn't really suffer. We were able to go down our science path, learn some amazing information about the nature of that material, and all the while, you kind of had this little treasure trove of uncertainty that there might be even more excitement. And so it's kind of like having a second Christmas. You get to open the package again, see if there's anything new inside of it that may enhance the science results you've already uh, uncovered. Right. Uh, just to clarify, we did extract a, most of that 70 grams from inside the tag SAM. So we were able to get into that collection chamber and get material out of there, which is why we weren't so worried about the stuck screws. So we have a pretty good sense of the nature of the collection. We are seeing a couple different types of rocks, which correspond to some of the variation that we saw on the surface of the asteroid. In particular, some of the boulders are very kind of rough and what we call hummocky. Others are very sharp and angular. We're seeing that two different shapes or morphologies expressed at the smaller scale in the return sample. The most exciting thing so far is that some of the samples are coated in a white kind of salty crust. And we've learned that they contain high abundances of phosphorus, which is a central element for all life on Earth. So what we call the astrobiological implications of the sample look fantastic. I'm really hoping for more of that kind of salty, crusty material, because that might represent evaporative residue from a large scale fluid or maybe ocean system on Baron, Bennu's parent asteroid over 4 billion years ago in the solar system history. Great question. So to understand why we're interested in carbon-rich asteroids like Bennu and the role they might have played in making the Earth a habitable world, and maybe even triggering the origin of life, we need to understand what we know about the early history of the Earth. And when the Earth formed very quickly after the Sun formed and the protoplanetary disk, where all the planets uh, were swept up into their current sizes, uh, it was a very violent environment. And there was large impacts of planetesimals crashing into each other. One object about the size of Mars crashed into the surface of the Earth and actually spalled off the material that went on to form our moon. So if there was any life on our planet during that period of history, it would have been wiped out in those violent epochs. So all of that had to settle down over hundreds of millions of years, at which point the Earth would have been barren, magma and volcanoes would have dominated the surface. And you needed the water and you needed the carbon and the other key elements of life to show up after that period to trigger the formation and origin of life on our planet. And that's the role we think these carbon-rich asteroids played. They came in late and they brought the essential elements of life to Earth. Yeah, we have uh, found all of the essential elements of life, which we normally call the chomps, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are abundant in the Bennu samples. 
And not only that, but they're in chemical forms that look really interesting to try to understand, first of all, how the Earth got its oceans, how it got its atmosphere, and ultimately the building blocks of life, like the amino acids that make up our proteins. We're finding some of those in the Bennu samples right now. The nucleobases, which are the letters of our genetic code. So really exciting insight into how organic chemistry progressed before life existed and how it might have actually led to the very first life forms on our planet. That's uh, what we're working on right now, the final step. So that we've got that base plate off so we can see the sample that's now inside TagSAM. It's fully exposed. We have a good sense of it. Uh, we do have to take off a couple more pieces. We don't expect those to be a problem. There's what we call the nose cone, which was uh, at the interior of the base of TagSAM and a kind of forced material into the collection chamber. That mylar flap, which we were able to get around to get the original material out, that will come off next. We're going to go do a whole series of high resolution photo documentation. Those images are always outstanding. And that'll give us a real insight is, is there anything different that was left in TagSAM versus what we had already extracted? And then we'll pull off the uh, perforated plate, which is the screen that forms the outer wall of the sample collection chamber, probably next week. And we should maybe next week or the week after get everything out of TagSAM, have it fully into the collection trays, and at that point, it's just curation, preliminary examination, and release of material to the science team. We've already got a lot of material out all over the world. We have material here in Tucson, about 250 milligrams. We sent material to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC, researchers at NASA's Johnson Space Center, Goddard Space Flight Center, and Ames Research Center all have material. Our colleagues at, in the United Kingdom at the Natural History Museum in London and all of their colleagues, at the Observatory of Côte d'Azur in France, at Hokkaido University in Japan, and Curtin University in Australia. All of these team members have received material. We just submitted over 75 abstracts to upcoming science conferences. So you'll see the first science results coming out over the next few months. And once we get into this full TagSAM collection, we'll get into the bigger particles. We kind of started small, understanding the chemistry and nature of the material, and ultimately working our way up to those centimeter sized stones, which will have a lot more textural relationships for us to understand the detailed processes that led to the formation of this material. Yeah, I'm in very high spirits. The mission was a phenomenal success. It's amazing to think of the, the fact that it's over, <laughs> that the prime space flight mission has completed. It's been such a huge part of my identity for so long. I'm wrestling a little bit with the fact that I'm a laboratory scientist again. There's a lot more freedom. Uh, my calendar's not nearly as crammed full of meetings as it used to be. Enormous pride uh, in what we achieved. And of course, the team has, uh, the next generation has taken over the vehicle. It's on its way to another asteroid, Apophis. They're going to uh, lead a fantastic characterization mission. So the legacy of OSIRIS-REx is just something I'm enormously proud of. The sample collection is phenomenal. Researchers are going to be working on it for the next decade. Spacecraft is healthy. And the early career people who grew up on OSIRIS-REx are now leading it into the future to target another potentially hazardous asteroid and continue to grow our knowledge about our closest celestial neighbors. In fact, it's important to note that in March, we're going to be releasing a catalog to the whole world. Uh, you'll have time to review that and make sample requests. Any qualified researcher anywhere on the planet is able to request material from NASA for their investigations, starting in just a couple short months. Yeah, the samples returned by OSIRIS-REx are a phenomenal scientific treasure. They're being very well taken care of by NASA and our colleagues at Johnson Space Center. And it is going to be a legacy that people are studying for decades, maybe even a century into the future.